Hey, good evening. My name is Richard Shear, and this is a special edition of Civics Forum. Uh, those are the shows around town meeting day, right before town meeting day, where I talk to candidates for school board, candidates for mayor, candidates for um, city council. I talk about the city budget with people who know the school budget, and we pretty much educate ourselves as to who it is who would be in our municipal government representing us. This is a special edition because I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Jack McCullough to the city of Montpelier. Although many of you know Jack because he's been around here a long time, he is my counselor in District 2 now. Jack. Thank you for having me. Good to see you, Richard. <clears throat> Where in District 2 are you? I live on Town Street. I've actually lived in uh, the time I've lived here in all three different districts at different times. And right now I'm on, on Town Street, which is a, town, a street that nobody even knows where it is. Okay, then where is it? If you, if <laughs> I know you, where it is, but you tell us. Drive out, drive out Main Street uh, towards East Montpelier, and you come to a point where you could turn right to get uh, go out Town Hill Road. And sometimes when you're waiting to turn there, you'll see on the left uh, a steep hill with people uh, coming down. That's Town Street. Oh, so Town Street's the place that people can't get up that hill during the winter. And slide down in, the, in winter, too, yes. Uh, in terms of, of Montpelier, how long have you been here? <clears throat> I've been here in 35 years. We moved here in 1983. My wife and I moved here from Michigan, where I'd been working at Legal Aid of Western Michigan. And uh, we moved to Vermont, and we rented a house in Waterbury for a few months. And we moved to Montpelier in uh, August of 1983. What was like? What was Montpelier like in 1983? Except for there were more people here than, than there are right now. There are more people. Uh, it was, uh, in some ways, a quieter place. There were not as many restaurants, not as much light nightlife. People would show sell these t-shirts that were a black t-shirt that said aerial view of Montpelier at night and it was just black. <laughs> um, there's a lot more going on now than there was then. On the other hand, for one thing, we could afford to buy a house in Montpelier in 1983. And the house we bought in 1983 we paid $35,000 for, which in today's dollars would be about $87,000. There's no houses you can buy in Montpelier for $87,000 now. Um, there were businesses, a, a different kind of businesses in Montpelier then than now. We had three hardware stores. We had... Uh, Just for those who, with short memories, Abishans, and then next to Abishans was Summers. Right. Where was the third? <clears throat> the third one was on State Street uh, next to the river where uh, Capitol Grounds is now, and it was uh, Nelson Brothers. And we had a shoe store, the uh, leather store on, uh, on Main Street. We had uh, a grocery store, a small grocery store right on uh, Main Street in Montpelier. There were it seems that there are more of the kind of businesses that people need to go to to, uh, to get things they need. Our commercial downtown, uh, and to a lot of people, seems stagnant. You still see empty storefronts on Main Street. What can we do? Uh, what could city council do to improve that? Well, I do worry about, uh, about the commercial sector downtown. Uh, I observe the same thing. You can always expect that there's going to be a certain amount of churn in uh, in retail space and businesses that uh, turn over because there has to be. You're not gonna, never going to have a hundred percent full occupancy, and it's probably not healthy for the city if you do because that means there's no place for someone new to come in. But for to have spaces that are vacant for a long time, have too many spaces vacant, uh, I think is not healthy. Um, what can council do to promote downtown business that they haven't done already? It's, it's pretty hard. It's, that's something that I, I'm really interested in learning more about to 
see what the city can do to encourage businesses to uh, to locate in the city. One of the things is I've, as you probably know, I've done a lot of housing advocacy work. If we could, we've had a declining population. Getting more people into town and getting more people who can afford to be here is one thing that will encourage businesses to be here. We have younger people who want to be able to walk to work, walk to where they go, and businesses are, are one, one thing we can do. But I think this, the city probably needs to take a more active role. We do have an economic development corporation now, and I think that the downtown business sector is one of the things that they're going to be interested in. The Economic Development Corporation was formed last year. Um, what do you see them doing that they're not that they're not doing right now? Um, I'm not sure what they're doing right now. That's something that's that's not what I focused a lot on. I I think that what we need to see is both an active role in looking for retail businesses, but also offices. I've heard of other places. I heard of an organization that was looking for office space in uh, in the Barry Montpelier area. They they called ba Barry and said we're looking for an office space here. They uh, <coughs> they mobilized. They quickly jumped on, showing them a whole range of office spaces that were available. And uh, I think they wound up staying in Montpelier. But the city seemed to take a pretty active role in trying to help the business relocate down there. And I would like it if, if Montpelier could do that here, too. Do you feel that the planning department is right-sized to do something like that? I think that uh, a number of the departments, and the planning and community development office is one of them, is probably smaller than it needs to be. You know, you hear people talk about, well, why don't we add assign this new project, this new activity to one of the departments. And uh, it's always a trade-off. Well, what do you want me to stop doing in order to take on this, this new activity? I think the uh, Parks Department is, is a similar situation. There's a lot of talk about people wanting a a new park in Montpelier, taking some of the open space on Sabin's pasture and turning it into some kind of parkland. But uh, there, there is a couple of price tags attached to that. One is, is the city going to spend the money to, uh, to buy the land to make a park? Another is, do we have the, uh, the staff in the Parks Department, Parks and Rec Recreation, to, uh, to maintain and provide uh, programming for a park on that side of the city, which would certainly be a good thing. But so I think there are things that we need to do. We probably need to look at uh, not cutting staff, but where do we need staff that uh, is inadequate for the, for the jobs they have. Do you feel that the city budget has any impact on housing prices in, in the city, that we have the highest tax rate already? Would you be into... Um, considering lifting that tax rate? Well, I look at it uh, in a different way. If we could... We uh, have the highest collective <coughs> tax rate between city and school. Right. What I was, what I was going to say is that uh, encouraging housing development is a way to help reduce the burden on taxes. If, if we have, are able to have new families with children in the schools, that mobilizes state aid to education, which, uh, which should help uh, some of the strain on the, uh, on the taxpayers. But doesn't it seem circular, you know, that the idea of raising the budget in order to attract more people in an actuality might attract fewer people when their property tax is such a differential between East Montpelier and neighboring communities in Montpelier? Do you feel that, that we've reached a point in taxation where we can raise our taxes significantly to, to gain more city services? I think there are some areas where we might need to gain more city services, but I 
my vision for Montpelier is really to have, people have heard me say this a lot, I think Montpelier is the best place in Vermont to live. People want to live here. Why? The, uh, we've got a population that's really involved in, in the life of the community. We have uh, <clears throat> a range of ages. We have great schools. We have a uh, great active downtown. As we were talking about, I think there's more going on downtown than there used to be. People want to, want to be here, and, and they can't find places to move to. And if we, could, if, if we could provide those opportunities, people would be here. Where is there empty land other than perhaps Sabin's Pasture over on Berry Street or Alan Goldman's land out on Terrace and in that area? Where is there empty land to build on in this town? There's not a lot. There's, a, there's some large parcels, as you, as you pointed out. There are some, uh, some buildings or, that are not being fully uh, used or used at all that could conceivably support housing. Um, some of the uh, upper floors in downtown, we're, we're doing the French block, but I think there are other places in upper floors in downtown where uh, they could be used for housing. Um, we've got buildings like the uh, funeral home on, uh, on Main Street, which has been vacant for years. You can, you can certainly imagine that being, uh, being used for housing. But isn't that ultimately Jeff Jacobs? decision whether to use it for housing or not? The owner of that property. Oh, of course. Yeah. I'm, the city is not going to, and I wouldn't want the city to go to individual owners and tell them, here's what you have to do with this property. What leverage does the city have then? That's, uh, is that leverage uh, <coughs> neutral, neutral leverage in terms of not giving up funds, existing city funds to leverage? or? Would you anticipate the city putting together packages? Like what? Um, helping with mortgages and things like that. I, I, I don't see the city uh, uh, supporting or, uh, or underwriting mortgages for private owners, if, if that's what you have in mind. But uh, again, we have, uh, we, we have Spaces available. I think even uh, getting into the conversation with all, with the prop, property owners with vacant property. Uh, several years ago, I was part of a committee on addressing barriers to housing development in Montpelier, and we had a series of recommendations, including addressing properties that are either being uh, being abandoned or being. Uh, demolished by, by neglect and creating uh, enforcement mechanisms so that uh, property owners don't allow their buildings to deteriorate and become useless when they could be providing housing uh, for people who want to live here. For renters in this city, would you see council revisiting uh, having landlords put up their, their properties for inspection and pay for that on a regular basis? I think that that is something that's worth examining. I'm not, I, in my years of working with tenants, it's very hard to get people to, uh, it's very hard to get landlords to maintain their property. Um, it's also, also can be difficult to get tenants to, uh, to complain about their property because they're, uh, they're concerned that they might be evicted if they do complain. And so, one of the things that I've advocated for at the state level is uh, a regular uh, scheduled inspection system, so every uh, housing unit would be inspected. Now, there's could that be inherently inflationary on on renters? In so far as it's like when businesses charge uh, a business to be in their establishment, the costs that are incurred by them are passed on to the business. Isn't that the same with renters? There's always a cost, and uh, one of the questions that we would need to look at is whether the uh, the cost of the inspection program is is going to be justified uh, based on whether we really 
based on a, the scope of the problem. But, it, but tenants, it, will, tenants would certainly pay the cost. Of it. Well, not only the inspection, but the remediation of the problem would be passed on to the tenants most likely. Everything a landlord does is ultimately paid by the tenants. Right. So yes. would that move make it more difficult? Are renters caught in a, in a vice? On one end, you know, they have problems in their housing. On the other end, if those problems are remediated, they're paying more. It's a no-win for the, for the renter. I, I've heard that argument from landlords a lot, and, and my concern is that there's a certain level of uh, housing maintenance and safety that property should not be uh, allowed to fall below, and uh, landlords just should not be allowed to rent out properties that don't meet uh, pretty minimal standards, and those are already set out in state law. Are there areas of the city budget, you spoke about some departments perhaps needing more staff. Is there any area that you would offset that in? Is there any area of city spending right now where you could see an examination? Periodically, council examines departments, and it's a delicate balance. You know, where you pick up, sometimes you shed. Is there any area that you would see for possible cost savings or, or programmatic advantage? I think every area is is subject to examination, and uh, and I wouldn't say anything's off limits. I, I can't tell you today that here's an example of something that I think we should cut because uh, I, I don't know that, that there is one, but I think every area needs to be examined for that. The Carlot project, uh, the Taylor Street project, what, what was your thought on that? It dragged on for a decade, you know, and it's finally they're putting shovels in this summer. What's your feeling on that project? I think that it's uh, going to be beneficial to the city to have uh, the transit, transit system center and also to have additional housing there. Um, it's been a tremendous uh, effort by the city. Um, I don't know what the city would have done. I don't know what the decision makers would have thought if, if they'd known this is how long it was going to take. The, um, the recreation department, is that properly sized? Our recreation in this city, is that sized correctly? I really can't answer that. You know, it, years for years, when my uh, my kids were in using uh, the recreation department, they were uh, signing up for the uh, for the sports. I had a better feel for what was going on in the rec recreation department. I don't really know what what they're doing now. the The building is obviously a, a real mess. What What do you feel about uh, that mess of a building? Uh, do you? Feel that a five million dollar, seven million dollar recreation facility is merited? I I can't answer that. I I, I can't answer that without study, and it's something. So I you would possibly on. support increasing our capital borrowing by five to seven million for a recreation center? I don't I don't think that's uh, the message that anyone sh should take from what I'm saying. The message that people should take is that. Uh, any expenditure, especially one of that magnitude, is something that uh, would need to be studied before, uh, before we uh, agree to it. The City Council established years ago a bonding limit. And it's an advisory limit, but it's been mm -hmm. set. Um, we have the methane project at the water treatment plant. We have the parking committee recommending a parking garage at State and Maine. We have a recreation facility that's being studied to five to eight million dollars. That would blow off the, the, the lid of that capital borrowing. Would you be in favor of changing capital borrowing to make it possible for the city to go beyond established limits? I'd be in favor of evaluating each one of these uh, questions and determining whether the value to the city was sufficient to uh, to justify the expenditure. So it is possible that you would <coughs> vote to change the city's bonding limit? 
what I would say is that we, we need to know what the cities need, what the benefits to each of these projects are, and, and whether they can, uh, can be justified. In terms of the city budget, for the last six years, they've tried to benchmark the, the budget to inflation. Would you favor that kind of benchmarking to inflation? A few years ago, the uh, city had a series of workshops over, over at the high school and brought in people from all over the city to talk about uh, what their priorities were, what they would like to see the city doing, and what direction we would like to see this city move in. Um, and you, I don't know if you were at one of those workshops, people were given little dots to say mm -hmm. what was important to them. Um, there were not many people who were saying the city should do less and the city should uh, pay its workers less and the city should uh, reduce the size of our staff. And so I think we need to pay attention to what the needs of the city are. And I think we need to be very responsible with the, with the taxpayers' money. But we also know that the taxpayers seem to support having an active uh, city government. Do you feel that there's any sort of connection between low school enrollment, which we have now, and the highest tax rate, collective tax rate in the state, or one of the highest collective tax rates in the state? Does that have an impact on, the, on younger families moving into this district? I think the uh, primary impediment to families moving into the district is the cost of housing. And I don't mean the uh, property tax, I mean just the cost of getting into housing. Is there anything in the city. that we can do to change that cost of housing? Even if we were to add on the margin, you know, 10, 15 different houses, wouldn't the demand just instantly chew that up? I think that there's a, a limit to how much uh, new housing this, the uh, market can absorb uh, by year. I think we, we need to. This, the council has uh, established a priority for developing new housing. The Regional Planning Commission has uh, established benchmarks for uh, not only Montpelier but other towns in the area to uh, help support the uh, anticipated uh, need for, uh, for additional housing. We've got the, uh, the new uh, zoning ordinance which how was that? Were you you were attentive to that? I imagine having an interest in housing. Did that end up the way that you thought it would end up, and were you kind of happy that it ended up where it ended up? I was more than attentive to it. I was working on it from you know for many many well, years. Well, bless those so, people because yeah. I was going to say this was a multi-year project. It, it was a multi-year project. I the other night I uh, I joked to the council that I spend more time at council meetings and anyone who's not on the council, and which is, might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but, uh, but I spent, and other people on the housing task force spent many years working on that project to make it, to uh, create conditions for, uh, for new housing development. One of the things that we see that I think is, so generally, yes, you know, could there be uh, changes in some of the details? I'm sure there could be, and I'm sure that as, uh, as we have experience with the ordinance that was passed, there may be things that that, that need to be changed or that make, make sense being changed. But uh, one of the things as we talk about uh, developing new housing that we have in the city now is the ability for uh, homeowners to, uh, to subdivide their homes, to create uh, uh, apartments or, or turn houses into duplexes. And I think that that's something that could could make a difference for people. We have uh, we have people whose kids are grown who are now two people living in a four thousand square foot house, which is bigger than they need, and maybe more expensive than they want to be in. But they also love their house, and they don't necessarily want to move out. And so, if they can if they can subdivide that house and enable a family to live in the house with them or in their own in their own home within that uh, within that structure that's a housing opportunity for people in the city 
and we've had in Montpelier the uh, first time home buyer program which has enabled people to buy in the city and uh, and bring children into the school district and uh, in the long run I think bringing young families into the city is uh, is going to be a good thing I don't think we should be I don't want to have Montpelier be uh, be a city where most of the people are uh, where the are senior center age, is booming. Are, where, well, I think it's fine for the senior center to be booming, but I don't think we want to have a city where you and I are the, uh, every, everyone's our age. Um, one more on downtown, revisiting downtown. Mm -hmm. Parking. That's something that people are constantly complaining about in this town. How do you view parking, particularly parking in downtown? As I think about... Uh, the uh, development needs in the city, you know, I'm, I always say that we have tremendous excess capacity for almost all of our infrastructure. Uh, parking is one area and uh, where we don't have excess capacity. And I think, I think we uh, probably need more parking. I know that people talk about we want to have a walkable city, we don't want people to park right away but but I think about for instance the uh, proposed hotel downtown with the with the parking structure right next to it I think that if we within the TIF we, so that right it's paid for potentially with future, future tax revenues potentially yeah and you know, that'll have to be uh, more fully developed but I think if we see that happen uh, people will come to visit Montpelier they'll park their cars in the parking garage and they'll leave them there and they'll spend all their time right in this right in downtown they'll be spending their money at our downtown restaurants they'll be buying things in our downtown stores and uh, without without the parking for the hotel that's not going to happen I've got a, one question it's it, it's the most uncomfortable question but it's the elephant in the room and that's uh, the controversy surrounding your appointment in retrospect, when Anne knew pretty much that she was not going to have opposition in January, do you think Anne should have stepped down at that point and said that she's going to leave her council seat and then had two elections in District 2? In retrospect, do you think that would have been better? There, there are two answers to that question. Uh, one is no. I think that uh, we wouldn't have been well the city wouldn't have been well served to go that uh, three months with that vacancy on the council and two the other part of it is that the uh, the appointment process that uh, was followed is the process that is uh, set forth in the charter even if uh, right uh, from that even, point on we, if, we all agree that that is the process in the charter but do you feel that, that just at that point in time, it might have been a better decision for her, for the town, actually? I don't. Okay. But, and, and part of it is that ev even if she'd stepped down earlier, there wouldn't have been a special election. There would not have been two No, there would have been two district running. seats. No. Uh, but, but one of them would still be uh, a vacancy which would be appointed by the council because the charter provides for uh, council vacancies to be appointed by the council. Now, if you're asking, should the charter be changed? Okay, should the charter be changed? I don't think so. I think what we've seen, uh, this was unique. This process was unique in my perspective, in my experience. In the last five, ten years, this is the third council vacancy that's been uh, filled by a, by a right. council appointment. And... Uh, and the previous two didn't have anything like this, uh, this level of acrimony. Uh, there was Angela, Terry, and Sarah. Okay. This would be the fourth. Angela was the one I was uh, forgetting about, right. yeah. Uh, I, I, we never saw no, anything never, like the, the acrimony right. that we had this time around. And, I, and that's why I was asking the question. You know, the acrimony is upsetting to me as, as well as you, as well as everyone, and you know, like to get beyond that. Oh yeah, we. Uh, this isn't isn't what anyone 
hoped. I think that uh, naturally I'm I'm pleased with the outcome, but but the process was uh, was not really in not really consistent with the kind of uh, community we hope to live in. Uh, we all live, or you and I, I should say, not we all, but you and I live in District 2. How can we bring District 2 back together you know, from this kind of acrimony at this point? What, what can be done to pretty much heal District 2 so it doesn't become a, a perpetual campaign all the way to town meeting day? Well, it would be unfortunate if that happens. My job, uh, now that I'm on the council, is to serve all the people in District 2, and that's what I'm planning to do. And my hope is that my track record will encourage people across the spectrum to support me. You know, I, I think of myself as I was going into these council meetings as kind of the ultimate what you see is what you get candidate because so? uh, because I'm pretty well known for my public activities in the city. I think people know who I am and uh, and what I stand for and I'm, I'm not going to change. Now you you're known in this town for housing but you also work with legal aid. Yes. What about our police department? Are there ways that, that the police department could be improved? I, from your legal aid perspective. From my legal aid perspective, most of our clients don't have, the mo I'm not aware of legal cases that most of our clients have with the, with the police. I can tell you that uh, a few years ago when the, when the proposal was to uh, deploy tasers in the city, there is a committee uh, to study the issue. I didn't uh, get on the committee, but I was very vocal in my... Uh, opposition to the deployment of tasers. Why? A couple of reasons. One is that uh, tasers are portrayed as not being lethal weapons, whereas in fact they are lethal weapons. And a certain number of people, based on uh, medical conditions or how they're used, will actually uh, die as a result of having a taser uh, <clears throat> applied to them. But, and that's typically a small percentage. But, but the other uh, big concern I have with tasers is that uh, if, the, uh, if they're out there, they kind of lower the, uh, the threshold for the use of force. And I don't think we uh, want that. I don't think that it's justified in the, uh, in the city of Montpelier. The council people are, uh, as you, as you know, sitting in council, that's not the only time that's spent for council people. They, there's time in preparation, but there's also time sitting on organizations uh, as a council member. Which organization would you want to sit on? Which outside organization would you want to be the council representative on? I, I'm kind of the new guy. And so you get the low. <laughs> so you, I, you get the low part of the totem pole. I may get the last pick. Uh, I, I'm not really sure. Uh, I I know that uh, one of the other members of the council, Rosie Kruger, has indicated that she wants to serve as a, the council representative to the uh, housing task force, and I think that's a great thing because uh, she's very interested in the issue and has some uh, has already given us some good ideas. Um, I'm open to pretty much doing whatever. I know the council has a seat on the on the library board. That they do. Montpelier uh, you're alive. You've yeah. got a seat on any number, <clears throat> any number, any of, number of commissions, boards. Yeah. Public safety. I was just wondering if there was one that, that just caught your eye. When when Connor came and spoke to me, he said that he wanted Montpelier you're alive. He wanted to work on the city's image with those people. Is, is there something other you would stay away from housing, but other than that is there another one that, that would just catch your eye? Assuming another council person weren't interested. Well, the things that I'm very interested in are, are public safety and also the library. And those are two things that I, I don't know what a uh, potential role would be, but they're things that I'm interested in. And I just have one final question. We have some friends who are interested in moving to Montpelier, and they don't believe Cinder and myself. Why should they move to Montpelier? 
What's your opinion? Well, it's a funny thing. Probably 20 years ago, you and I had this <laughs> conversation, and I told you how great it was to live in the city of Montpelier, and it, this is a great place to raise a family. My children have had, uh, had a great uh, community life and also a great education living here. I think that uh, Montpelier has, uh, has some really unique characteristics, partly because of being the city, uh, the capital city, but also because uh, we, have, uh, we have great people living here. As I said at the beginning, it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, people who, who are involved in making the city the great kind of place that it is. And you know, people want to volunteer and all kinds of things. And uh, I, I'm a real booster, real cheerleader for the city of Montpelier. Fantastic. Jack? Thank you so very much for coming to see You're us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. This is our special edition of the Civic Forum. Thank you for watching.